Mm. Hanhur 2's album, 60 Holes, is in my herd. <laughs> and because we were talking about it the first time you were uh, here in Finland, and you mentioned that it was a really, really important album for you, that, that it sort of opened some gates. I don't know if you keep constantly listening to it, but I know that it, it was a really, really important album for you. So that is my guess. You know, yeah, it's funny because we saw it was a big deal for me, actually, the night before we played, I played with Circle at Sideways Fest when her two were playing as well. And that was a really big deal for me. Um, yeah. so, so I was thinking about what my album would be if I just could pick one. And I was thinking about people like Eliane Radig and Sun Ra um, and also yeah. thinking just practically like, ah, maybe it would have to be something just I have a CD of cowbells. Like what, what's going to be the most use to me if I can literally only have one record for the rest of my life. But actually, I think your answer is the correct one. Although I hadn't remembered it today, but I, I think you're absolutely spot on. <laughs> um, one of those correct answers. Uh, yeah, well, I think probably it's one of those discs I always bring up because it's just every track on it is beautiful and it just, the whole thing hangs together. It's astonishing music. And it's sort of, the, the second album also on Shinachi was very good. Uh, and then they started to get a little bit more produced. And yeah, I know what you more, mean. Yeah. Yeah, a bit polished. So that first album is just perfect because it's really well recorded. But it, and it's almost like it's just all killer, like all of the most, I don't know. It's And, and the artwork is amazing. So I think you've absolutely nailed that, Yanni. Well done. <laughs> all right. I, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I think it was uh, quite easy at least to suggest this album for you to <laughs> uh, at least to remember. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I realize that I, I, I um, really struggle with this question and, and it made me realize I know shockingly little about where Yanni's coming from and I, I was just racking my brains for the few little tidbits I picked up so I'd wondered perhaps I don't think I'm going to be right but I wondered if it might be like a really classic punk record like the f uh, first Dead Kennedys or first Stooges album so I, I and then uh, but I also <laughs> emailed uh, some people close to Yanni to try and get clues. <laughs> <laughs> so my choice is going to be uh, Sedatives from the Pharmacy by Saxa, which I know nothing about. Okay, <clears throat> I think you you hit quite close with this tool, Jeez. Oh, okay. But not with this one that you mentioned because I don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and also, uh, because this kind of question, what is, <laughs> what put you listen to the rest of your life? It sort of feels like a punishment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I thought if I should do it, if I was locked in a room. And I would only have, besides food and water, I would have to listen to 10 days a day, 10 times a day, one particular album that would be Popol Vuh's Let's the Tage, Let's the Nechte, The Last Days, The Last Nights. Oh. I've I, I found it, there is some, like, really, really out of this world feeling without it being too uh, 
uh, atmospheric or too clean. And it has some like stooges like riffs going on. And it has this raw energy uh, beside this like really, really spiritual feeling. So um, uh, after thinking, I would choose in my imprisonment uh, this album. It would be, yeah, the Popal Wolf. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose thinking about it like that um, as a punishment, you really probably want to choose the quietest album possible. Something that's just going to be the least, it's going to cause the least amount of audio distress. Yeah. So, but yeah, Pop Hall Vu. Did you, did you like the soundtracks they did for, I'm thinking about like Aguirre, Wrath of God? Mm-hmm. I, yes, I, I, I've been listening to that a lot and like all this stuff. But I, I like this like comparison uh, of like physical force that is in this album, this last days, last nights, and the really, really well <clears throat> presented, truly spiritual feel. So they make this kind of a combination that it, uh, has kept me riddled throughout the years. I don't know how how they did it. So it's like a, um, something that I haven't understood. So then it makes it enjoyable to listen to it again and again. Hmm. I haven't listened to that one, but I, I will do so this afternoon. I don't know okay. that one. Yeah. I thought of another album which I think would fit the bill, which would be uh, Yoshiwada, uh, Earth Horns. And it's uh, ah. from a very long performance and very uh, these huge, huge horns which stretch across a big room and it's mixed with electronics. Uh, and yes. the album is maybe a 70 minute excerpt from it, but that would. Yeah, yeah, thinking about it as a punishment, or, or I'm trapped in a room and I can only listen to me, this one album, then probably that one would be a good choice because it's just just does one thing, but it does everything. Just this kind of. I do, I do know, by the way, about this experience, ex- experiment that they are doing in Germany, Halberstadt. They are playing this John Cage song, uh, which is due to last for 700 years. So they are uh, doing it in the church. So the notes of the piece, they are calculated so that uh, one note can last for months or maybe years, so that in the end, uh, this whole piece will last for I can't remember exactly, uh, but it was like 775 years or something. Uh, so they calculated uh, to last for that long because at that point the CD was that old. So they were, were starting to celebrate the city's history by this performance. Yeah. And we visited there, there once we were touring in Germany. And we went to listen to that one note that was going on at the time. And then we heard this. In the church. And I, I, I think it's a really, really brilliant idea. And I really hope they can keep it going because <laughs> it's going to yeah, involve generations uh i would say like how do you calculate this 20 <laughs> 20 mm. generations to pass it on yeah you keep on playing this song <laughs> That's quite, quite amazing how is it performed or it was performed they were <clears throat> using uh, like uh, big bags fu- filled with sand, the simplest possible way of using gravity uh, that would push the certain button 
and they had this um, organ that was going on and they were uh, of course it also needs some power so they were thinking what would the power source be uh, after let's say 300 years so they have like optional power sources as well and the pressure came just from the gravity but somebody had to take care that the system is working and the uh, nodes don't have any breaks wow yeah so it might be almost like a family business they would have to the person who tends to the bags yeah passes down their knowledge from yeah and they live by grants <laughs> from the <laughs> government or from the city and they yeah they just yeah. um i wonder yeah. Uh, they, on. <laughs> yeah or they could just get uh one of those big tortoises you know those ones that live for like 250 years <laughs> do it by tortoise power but they need educated, three educated tortoises <laughs> <laughs> yeah at some point maybe, maybe yeah do you know the story about john cage going into um he went into one of those is it is it called an anabaric chamber where they where it's designed so sound doesn't bounce anywhere um, so it's meant to be completely, it might not be, I, I think anabaric is wrong. Uh, it might, it's it's like, uh, you, they have this crazy, the walls are like crazy triangles. Yeah. And so yeah. if you're talking like this direction, somebody standing there wouldn't be able to hear what you said because the sound just doesn't bounce. So yeah. he went, um, he went into uh, one of these chambers and, was searching for silence but eventually he started to hear two sounds one was like a high-pitched whistling and then the, the then there was a low-pitched thrum uh he could also hear his bloodstream uh yeah um sorry his pulse the low-pitched thrum was his bloodstream he, he had tuned into and then the high pitch thing he tuned into was uh his nervous system operating he thought there was a problem with the room so but then so his discovery was that he would not be able to find silence until his body until he died but even then he was <clears> still <throat> producing sound by through his decomposition <laughs> yeah i i have visited a room like that uh because well, um uh, maybe 15 years ago there was like a science fair uh, science exhibition and they had built this kind of room and of course uh, mm, this was not maybe the right kind of situation to enter that room because you came out of uh, the ordinary chaos but uh, I could sense <laughs> the silence and the problem with the silence because I, I had the chance to go there alone but i only had maybe like two or three minutes because there was queue uh, all the time so i i didn't want to be there for for an hour or so but it, it was a really nice experience uh, too. yeah it sounds like a nightmare to me but that's just because i've got uh, tinnitus yeah, I've got a yeah, I, I do, but it, it's a really easy one. But that also makes it impossible to me to uh, be in silence. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this one I found really hard. So I gave up trying to nail it. But I was thinking about uh, of all the I was thinking about the way way Richard writes and positions himself and how he must spend hours and hours like finding information 
like uh, studying, like he's got this mm, stamina to do it. So I, I, I thought all, all these kind of writers and authors, starting from Herodotus and his history, because it must be a fascinating book. I haven't read it. I have only heard that it's uh, pretty much readable and really much uh, informative, even uh, in these days. But then again, I thought about science fiction writers, because that could also be, be the case. Like guys like Isaac Asimov, how do you say it, Isaac Asimov, or Ray Bradbury, guys like that. And then, then there was one author that kept on coming to my mind, and this is not going to be the right answer. But I thought that his way of uh, approaching writing is so close to Richard's that I say, John Will Williams. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's the American writer, um, like in the early 20th century. And if I'm not totally wrong, he only wrote three novels. And one, uh, like the stoner, is about university life. And then <clears throat> the other one is, uh, is it like Butcher's Crossing, which is about uh, the main characters uh, and his team's trip to go to hunt buffaloes in Colorado uh, uh, in the, was it uh, mid 19th century? And the third book yeah, uh, is about, uh, it's about Augustinus, the first Roman emperor. So this, like the time stretch and the way of uh, changing view is really huge on each uh, books compared to those books. And still the old books, they are very, very readable. They are like fantastic literature, even though uh, the starting points are totally different. And uh, the language and the atmosphere, it's so sensitive and almost, almost like quiet. The, the, uh, those are not like big Hollywood drama. They are almost like the antithesis to that. Even though there are many, many like, cruel and sad uh, things happening in the plot. Uh, um, maybe I'm just talking about one of my <laughs> favorite writers, but, <laughs> but uh, why I'm answering like this is uh, Richard came to my mind and he keeps on coming to my mind uh, uh, every time I think about John Williams. So this is my answer. I know it's not right, but it's an answer. I think it's a really good answer and it's not a million miles away. I, I, I only read two of those books because uh, obviously Stoner had a sort of um, re rebirth and a big press push, I think, on the back yeah, of a, yeah. maybe a Guardian article. Somebody had recommended it. So I read that. And the, But the, the one for me is Butcher's Crossing. I thought that was one of the best things I've, I've ever read. Um, and I pushed that book onto probably five people so far. I like it that much. Um, uh -huh, yeah. So it really, yeah, it would be, it would be up there. When I was thinking about the question today, um, it again, it wasn't the name that occurred, but it would, it would definitely be Butcher's Cross would definitely be in my top ten because it's okay. So can I get half point? You can have a yeah. I think you have a half point there. Um, did you read those in Finnish at, or were they in? English. Are they, uh, at the time I read those, they weren't translated, so I read them in English. Yeah. But it was, well, yeah, uh, when like Stoner became a hit, when it was sort of found, uh, yeah. Yeah, was it like maybe 10 years ago or something? But uh, 
I have them in, in my bookshelf and I keep on like sort of watching them every now and then because it made such a huge impression on me. Yeah. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, really amazing writer. Just perfect. Not no no fat, you know, but very this kind of rich language as well without ever being too much. Just just very uh, precise. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, my I was thinking about the question and and uh, I, I don't know about favorite. I'm trying to get out of the the mindset of favorite. Yeah. And best and all of this because it's like competitive language and you know that might sound like quite a piffling thing but I think it's sort of it does you know we can tend to be competitive beings so um, so not favorite on, and not best but some writers that made a big impression just recently the last year I've just been reading Thomas Pynchon um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and you know there's some I don't like everything about it, but I think the sheer scope and the bombast of it is just absolutely incredible. Quite sort of challenging to read, but just amazing and over the top. And uh, yeah, so I just finished Against the Day by by him, which took us about nine months to read, but it was really amazing. Um, so I, I would think about him, uh, Ursula Le Guin would be there reading Wizard of Earthsea, magic stuff, and, uh, Iris Murdoch, The Sea, The Sea, uh -huh, a very yeah. special book, very sort of dull and claustrophobic <laughs> and amazing. I like dull books and, I, yeah, yeah, really and dull movies. And... <laughs> but I, I think if I had to choose one, it would be Michael Faber, who wrote The Book of Strange New Things and The Crimson Petal and the White. I think both of those are just out on okay. the I haven't read those, so it goes to my list. So, yeah. <sighs> Yeah, it's, Book of Strange New Things. It's like again, it's it's it, on paper. It sounds really exciting. A, a, a Christian missionary goes to an alien planet to deliver the word of the Bible to the the aliens there or the the locals there. Yeah. And but when it, the planet itself, actually, everything is incredibly humdrum and just like everything's really dowdy and brown and nothing really happens in the book there's no action and it's sort of the it seems like it's going to be a sci-fi novel but it does everything everything is is a surprise it, it it at every turn it does what you don't expect it to do which is very little um, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> it's a really amazing book and then the crimson petal and the white is like is an astonishing achievement uh, like I, I think about I've only read that once and I think about it and, I'm, and I just cannot fathom how it was made um, so I, I think I would put that up there the pinching means a lot That's that's been an incredible experience the last year and a half reading through his books and um, um and also a book called Starlight by Stella Gibbon, which is a very, very strange book and uh, um, set in London about um, two sisters who live in a house there and their, their neighbours, very odd, queasy book, uh, sort of an oddity in her canon as, as well but but it's got some dark magic about it so but john williams was a great answer half a point <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I don't know an awful lot of Mika's work, and um, so just a few things that I watched when uh, Yussi suggested that he make the uh, video for Lily. Um, so I'd seen a few of the short films, but I was just looking today at, at some of the trailers, and there was one that really stuck out called Tectonic Plate. It's sort of um, look very grainy and uh, v very fast editing of, of lovely film stock and stuff. And I just sort of had a feeling that that one might be close to Yanni's heart. But I also wondered about whether um, the film that Circle soundtrack, the Six Day Run, maybe is one that Yanni's fond of. Because that looks amazing as well. I haven't seen that. Uh, I've got the soundtrack, which is great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, just a guess, tectonic plate. Right answer is Six Day Run. Hey. You were close enough, so I accept this as a right answer. I'll take a half a point too. If we're <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I, I really like it because I, I like the idea in general uh, of people who have sort of obsessions and they have this quirky thoughts and, and they really push on to make those. So. Yeah, I think uh, what makes me like it is the subject because this ultra runner is in that way close to my heart that I appreciate people who keep on doing that they know is totally insane and it will hurt their bodies, their health, their relationships with other humans, but still they do it. So I, I like this kind of stories. So it sort of reminds me of like, we were all already talking about Aguirre, Herzog's film. Um, and this kind of, these kind of themes that are really close to my heart. People are doing some insane stuff just because they feel they have to do it. So in this way, six day run, uh, is my favorite from Mika's works, even though the other have some different, uh, clearly different approaches. Um, but yeah, this strikes to my heart, so this is why I like it the best. Yeah. Uh, the Herzog uh, documentaries, some of those are really incredible with dealing with these kinds of people he's obviously drawn to those like grizzly man and yeah like yeah short film about the mountaineer which i can't remember the name of um he's another one of those characters and then one of my very favorite films is the white diamond yeah have you seen that one yeah i just thought that was this guy is just so out there and sort of turning his pain into this mad, uh, beautiful obsession. Uh, it's just, yeah, really great. Yeah, and I also have to mention this into the abyss. Okay, now we're talking about Herzog, Herzog <laughs> films. Maybe it's sort of off, but it also made a huge impact on me. This guy was sentenced to death penalty and how this Herzog managed to communicate with him as a real whole human being. So it's also a, a really incredible work not only as herds of being a documentarist, but him being a full understanding human being. And that is shown on the film as well. So I do 
appreciate this kind of uh, expressions that we can make if we are if we are like really considerate and feeling human beings. Mm. My guess is quite plainly based on what we talked about a couple of days ago, and you mentioned Nern root. <laughs> I think it might be the one for you. And then I read about it a little bit more. So, uh, so the Wikipedia said that plants makes a makes a sound that it's a bit like chimes. So I thought of, uh, okay, plant that makes sound. So it it must be something that you like at least. <laughs> but, yeah, that is my guess. It's really good. Yeah, the um, just just to sort of give those who aren't familiar with Skyrim a uh, bit of context. Nernroot is this plant that exists in. Uh, in the uh, the Elder Scrolls games, and Skyrim was the first one I played, and it, yeah, it makes a sound if you go near it. But it also crops up in the same company. They also made a Fallout game, and a, a version of this plant um, perhaps exists in, in that game as well. So they they're actually merging these two universes together. So yeah, I was thinking about the question. And I was just thinking about specific plants in our garden. I, I planted a Chinese rowan in the corner, and it's just turning orange now with the autumn. And uh, we also have a crooked hazel, which is um, also known as Harry Lauder's walking stick, because he, he was like a, I think he was a Scottish comedian who had like a really bendy walking stick. Um... And I dug a pond over the summer and have some nice plants in there. Creeping Jenny, for instance. What was that? Creeping Jenny. Okay. It's like a lovely yellowy green, it's a fast growing plant which sort of spreads out over the water. But I think Yanni gets a point. I think Nern Root is <laughs> very much the correct answer. All right, yes. So I know that circle have moved away from from this period. It was a beautiful period as well. I loved the beginning of the show when the band would come out and get out of their normal clothes into the spandex and the wrist uh, bracelets and stuff like that. It was very good. But my feeling probably is that Yanni would be prefer to be in just the black so that's my answer is black <clears throat> the color is right but I, I i think my favorite was maybe like 10 years ago when i used to wear this corset like this Mm, which was made out of leather straps. I mean, it had this really like sadomasochistic feel to it. And with this corset, I would wear uh, fishnet stockings. So it was really, um, it took some guts to wear them. But when I uh, started using them, um, on the gigs at the time, I sort of got used to those garments. And I happened to forget, forgot them uh, into some random backstage. So I, I could not find them anymore. And I felt really bad. Because I, I, I had started to feel really 
really easy and really full of power wearing those. So that was my favorite uh, costume. And we were, uh, the first time we started to wear spandex, uh, we just, we could talk about it. And yeah, let's put them stockings on. And I um, grasped it, the word like stockings. So I thought, yeah, they could be fishnets. It could have some like SM feel to it as well. So I don't know why I liked it, but I felt, really cozy and easy on the stage <laughs> wearing those, yeah. But black, so you get half a point. Okay. I think I, I personally I would prefer something with a lot of folds to hide my own folds, if you know what I'm saying. And I, I was thinking that it's a really good idea to have work clothes, like it gives you the authority and it gives you the freedom to not to be just Janne. Uh, you can transform yourself uh, what the songs are asking you to be or whatever. It, it could be a play as well or it could actually be an occupation as well. Like think of the police or like nurses. So there is a reason why they are using work clothes. So now that we play rock and roll, we use work clothes as well. And I don't actually know what will be the, se uh, the next thing that we are going to wear. But it has to be in the same vein of thought. Like we are going to work and we have to look like we are working. And also these customs, or let's say they're just clothes. They will have to work as tools for us mentally. So in this way, it's quite simple. But we, ha we, we can talk and decide and, yeah, we must talk about this side also together. Because yeah. now you're so strongly with us, so everybody has, has their say. I quite like the idea of wearing almost something like a green and leafy robe. <laughs> 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 well I'm not competitive. I'm just having fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I am. I am competitive, and I feel like I've been roundly beaten, thrashed. 